You're listening to Tucson Tech Talk with your host, Aaron Moss, on Tucson Business Radio X. Welcome to this episode of Tucson Tech Talk. I'm your host, Aaron Moss, broadcasting from the Tucson Business Radio X studio in the Stewart Title Building on Broadway in Tucson, Arizona. Our focus today on the show is technology in, we can say, taxes, finance, money, things like that, uh, and how we've understood those to affect technology in the past couple of years. We have two very qualified guests with us today that is going to help us to understand how this technology has affected accounting finance uh, industry over the years. Uh, on my left, I'd like to introduce an accounting graduate at the, uh, from the University of Arizona and currently a shareholder leading the tax and accounting divisions at RNA CPAs. She specializes in tax compliance and consulting with clients in a variety of fields, including aerospace, manufacturing, restaurant and hospitality industries. In addition to her work in the fields of tax and accounting consulting, she is also accredited in business valuations. Ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to introduce Amy Chavez to the program. Thank you for having me. And uh, to my right, our second guest has over 40 years in public accounting, giving him a very broad and diverse background in accounting uh, involving clients from small emerging businesses uh, all the way to those that are better established and larger. He's concentrated in consulting to small businesses and the numerous aspects of assistance that emerging and startup businesses have. He has considerable experience in various phases of the public accounting, including management consulting, sophisticated income taxes, uh, estate tax planning, as well as resolving retirement and financial planning issues. He is also familiar with incorporation and pension issues. He's celebrating over 35 years as the managing member of Flowers Rieger and Associates. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, we want to introduce Michael Flowers to the program. Aaron, it's great to be here. Thank you. Okay. So, uh, uh, by the way, it's Rieger that is spelled R-I-E-G-E-R. Certainly. <laughs> okay. Flowers Rieger. Okay. So, uh, so just to kick things off on this uh, subject of how accounting has affected uh, technology in the years, you know, we have all these apps and applications. People can download these uh, things on their phone, on their computer that will help them with their taxes for their personal life or their business. In your experience, uh, because we have lots of experiences uh, right here in this uh, room, uh, are any of these applications any good? Or should someone still be trying to uh, hire a traditional CPA? Anything? The applications is, are as good as the user. And just because an application has tax software or tax software, it's called LACERT. And we spend about $20,000 a year on maintaining and updating, and it's a national service that um, thousands of CPAs use. And just because we have the software doesn't mean that somebody could come in and fill out a tax return. So the software, when you know how to use it properly, is unbelievably useful. And I don't think there's... 1% of the preparers out there anymore that are doing it manually. At one point in time, it was manual. At one point in time, it was uh, the software cards you would fill out. Um, it's called fast tax. You would fill out forms. It would be sent out to a processing center. The tax return would come back incorrect. You fill out some more forms. And that process has now turned to immediately I can do a three- or four-year projection, and I can change numbers rather quickly. So there are apps, uh, QuickBooks, Quicken, TurboTax, or very valuable software applications and products. However, it really depends on the user. And in, in both Amy and my mind, there's no substitute for having a CPA if you're dealing with your income taxes or especially your business taxes. And the more complicated it is, the more you're going to need a CPA. Mm -hmm. So when, how would somebody know if they are, if they should be doing the uh, CPA uh, traditionally, or if one of these apps is actually good enough for, for what they're doing? Well, I think that that all depends. I mean, I have a lot of people come in for, to find out that exact answer. And I always try to be really honest with them because you don't want to 
I never want to charge somebody a fee if I'm not providing them a benefit. So if it is somebody who's coming in and they have a simple W-2 tax return and they don't have anything other than the standard and they're comfortable using a computer software like TurboTax, that's probably the best fit for them. But as soon as you start having anything like a small business or any kind of investments, that's when you get into even if you think that you can plod through the software, at some point you're going to want some consulting or some guidance, and that's really where the CPAs come in. It's not just in plugging numbers into the software. If if that's all we did, then we're going to be obsolete. It's a lot more about the consulting and the helping. I think what you mean is like data entry. Right. Because that's what a lot of these apps are. You They ask you a question, you insert your data, mm-hmm. and then you get a – you get a bing result at the end, you know? Right. So um, how are new technologies impacting how tax returns are prepared? And is, like your company, RNA, Mm -hmm. CPA, are they addressing those issues, those changes? So, you know, technology changes everything, and it changes it in inches, and it changes it in miles. And Mm -hmm. one of the things that we've experienced over the last, I would say, 13 years Um, since we've decided to go paperless at our firm, is moving moving the firm constantly and being aware of technologies that can make us more efficient so that we can spend more time guiding the client as opposed Mm -hmm. to the data entry is the way you put it. Mm -hmm. And But the main goal in all of it is always as we're turning that ship, as we're turning that dial, not to have the client feel that we're going through all of these technology changes Mm -hmm. on the other side. And especially, I don't know how much you've experienced this, but in the last five years, I mean, there's uh, there's so much available out there. And so it turns into one of those things where if you're running a tax division of a firm, you know, how much do you hold back? How much do you want to see if something is going to work for another firm before you try it versus if I wait, are we going to be the last ones? You know, it's mm-hmm. always that that tipping point between you know, being the first one out there and waiting for something tried and true. I I would say our general experience is we try very seriously not to be the first ones to try the newest product. (laughs) Or the last. Exactly. First or last. (laughs) Definitely first and last. But um, what we've noticed is sometimes when software or compete, every year we get an offer from a competing company to have them be our software provider. Mm -hmm. And every year we tell them no because it's not only the software. So, for example, if you came in, we're spending $20,000, and some firms will say, Mike, we'll charge you $10,000. That $10,000 savings is going to be eaten up the first month that we use that software and the amount of training, training. downtime, mm-hmm. reloading, finding proving, buttons. making sure that what they <laughs> said they were going to yeah. slide across did slide across. And it's, mm-hmm. it's an unbelievable transition. So it's not a cost-type market for in the CPA. We're very loyal, and I'm sure Amy's firm, whatever software they're using, they're very loyal to that. Even if you cut the price 50%, most CPAs are going to say, we don't trust you. We Even if you were the, the best software, all our staff knows this software. Mm. And if you said it's ten grand, however, these eight forms are done differently, we're going to lose that in time and, and we're going to have more – non-chargeable time and more research and more studying to get up to speed. So we stay with the same software company since probably for the last 20, 25 years. And, you know, I, I noticed that, you know, CPA firms, they're very loyal to their to their systems, okay? Because you have if you to. Have, yeah, mm-hmm. you have to because your, your customers, if they've been filing things, you know, going back 10, 20 years and you're on a different system now, how are you going to go back and, you know, retrieve those things and pull them to your current system, okay, with a couple of clicks of a the, button? The, the the biggest change, Amy was mentioned in the last 13 years. Again, I've been doing this since 19, I graduated in 76. I started as a CPA in 78 after two years' experience. I got my CPA. I was born in 78. Well, here we go. <laughs> I was doing tax returns when you were born. That's embarrassing, but <laughs> I've, I've started in New York City as a CPA and been involved in taxes all my life. And 
we have a really strong opinion that um, the tax software companies like the one that we use invested millions and millions of dollars, especially most recently with the new tax law. The new tax law that was recently enacted, basically effective 2018, was the most dramatic tax law change I've seen in my entire career. Mm -hmm. And that's the Reagan 86 Act and its other dramatic tax changes. But the most recent tax law change was the, the most dramatic change and the most significant effect on even the physical forms of the tax returns used to be a four-page form. Now it's all on page one with schedule one, two, three, four, five. Mm -hmm. So they said they'd get it down to postcard side. It's like a postcard with 15 asterisks, and all the asterisks are the other forms that support it. So with the new tax law, I think that's where um, everybody's super cautious and nobody would make a move from the software company. Unless somebody went with the software company and with the new tax law, wait, all of a sudden this company isn't maintaining the way they have traditionally because they didn't hire enough staff and they didn't pay enough attention. But Lacerda is one of the biggest ones. And, Mm -hmm. you know, as you get down and down on the list, they're not investing as much in technology Mm -hmm. and staff to make sure that they have all the changes with the new tax law. So, um, I'm sorry, what were you saying? No, I was just going to say that I think that a lot of our focus, at least at, at our firm, and you can speak for, for your firm, Michael, but a lot of our focus hasn't been in our actual tax software and making a change from that because, as Michael said, with every tax law change that we deal with, also switching up our tax software would make us less efficient and less available for our clients. But where our focus has been is on helping the clients with businesses get their numbers cleaner, have them make more sense throughout the year. And that's where we're employing a lot more technologies is in trying to, you know, really partner with our clients a little bit more throughout the year and hold their hand so that once we get to tax time, that's when we're making tax decisions. We're not sitting there trying to reconcile a bank account, which you have to do in order to have the numbers correct, but it's not... You're not going to get a client to feel good because you reconciled their bank account. You get a client to feel good because you can give them some advice on how to turn that dial or or move, you know, what they're doing to make them more profitable. Or make the or make or save them some money. Right. <laughs> That's the big thing. But uh, so you you mentioned that uh, some of these about some of these softwares. What what software is maybe your firm acquiring or investigating to take advantages of some of these technologies? Well, you know, we have uh, what we call our CAS department. It's uh, Client Accounting Solutions. So we're trying to basically replace the old version of bookkeeping with what we call accounting solutions. Instead of a service, it's a solution because you don't want to have to monitor it. You want to make sure that your numbers are good. You want you want somebody who enjoys that to be doing it so that you can run your business because that's what you enjoy. So over the last couple of years, we've really been looking at, you know, different online and cloud softwares in order to be able to have them communicate with each other. Everything to linking payroll and with QuickBooks Online and with different um, types of expense reimbursements so that if you have somebody in the field, they're scanning a receipt with their phone. They're not trying to collect a whole bunch of paper and give it to you at the end of the month. So it's more about trying to help our clients be a little bit more on time and using different software solutions to do that. Now, there, there's, a, there's a, a back office and then there's like a client end to that soft, to a lot of these softwares. Yes. Is that right? Mm-hmm. Okay. And uh, so do you see that? Do you see that actually having a positive outcome or does it, is it just a, a dream at this at this time? <laughs> if you would have asked me that last year, I would have said, well, last year and a half, I would have said it wasn't a dream. It was a nightmare. But <laughs> once we a nightmare started, is a dream. But yeah. <laughs> it's a bad dream. <laughs> once we started to work out a lot of the kinks in it and mm. make it a little bit more fluid so that the client was having a better experience, mm. that's when everything started to kind of change for us. And I would say that, you know... It has been really positive. I've got a restaurant client who started with us a year and a half ago, and there were a lot of bumps in the first four or five months trying to get everything linked and everything working. And now that client's extremely happy because they can go in at any time and see where their cash flows are at. 
Hmm. You know, the the power of information shouldn't be underestimated for an entrepreneur. Mm -hmm. So uh, I I can see a a parallel kind of going through here because we've done this uh, show uh, several times with different industries. But there's always a period of training. And Mm -hmm. that uh, kind of goes through with with any business. Anytime you start something new, uh, a a new major software for for an accounting firm, there's got to be some sort of training period that you can do in your downtime. Before the show, we were talking about when's the best month of uh, downtime of a CPA. Sometimes it's never. Sometimes. You know, we we talked about the summertime, but maybe the summertime is the best time to be uh, maybe looking or even trying to uh, trying to uh, 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 trying to implement some of these uh, services on a trial basis. What do you think? Aaron, appreciate that as CPAs, we deal with pretty much every industry and every size business. Mm -hmm. I mean, at our firm, we don't do the super large clients, but we've touched probably 150 different types of businesses as a rough estimate of the different clientels and everything from a, an owner that's doing some sort of accounting to the wife who's never seen in a, a bookkeeping or accounting course and they're doing the books to one of my clients hired a 16-year-old kid and we've had tremendous problems. <laughs> oh, my. And I told him, please don't do that. Well, he's fr- I trust them. And, you know, the, the dilemma in Tucson in particular and and I'd say the smaller cities having grown up in New York, the business community is a little bit more sophisticated. But in Tucson, there's a number of entrepreneurs and just because you're a great cook doesn't mean you, you should, should open, open a restaurant. Your own restaurant. Yep. And we and in all industries we have those type people that, hey, I'm a really good electrician and I I can build a business, but don't ask me anything about accounting. Mm-hmm. And so we deal with that type client. So there's no like typical CPA client that they've been well trained and they've went through college and they've had some finance courses. Mm-hmm. If you have that type client versus somebody who's relatively even older and been doing it for 20 years, maybe he's not doing it right. We mm-hmm. tend to get a lot of clients that start off with bookkeeping services when they're doing maybe 50 grand a year and then 10 years later they're doing 700 grand a year and they're still with the bookkeeping service and wave out way outgrown their capabilities mm-hmm. so as amy says that's where you come in and recently we had one that was a sole proprietor paying a, a tremendous amount of self-employment tax with no pension plan and in a one hour meeting I suggested that we create an LLC, put her and her husband on the payroll, Mm -hmm. and they start to fund the pension plan. Mm -hmm. And I demonstrated about $70,000 in tax savings Mm -hmm. in a one-hour meeting because they've had a bookkeeper that essentially tell me what happened yesterday and I'll put it on the form. Mm -hmm. And Amy and I are more interested in... That's what's happened yesterday. Let's think about next year and let's see if this was my business, what would I do? Absolutely. I'd be an LLC. I would have an S Corp. I would put myself on a payroll. Very simple procedural things. And at the end of the day, that old business compared to the new business, the new business is going to have another sixty, seventy thousand dollars $70,000 in cash flow. Now, see, all of that that you just mentioned – can't be done on an app. No, no. <laughs> and, and it never will be. Mm-hmm. And it never will be. And even if you're doing your own bookkeeping and you're the QuickBooks expert of everything and you've done all your bookkeeping and you're ready to do a tax return, there's no well, – I'm going to be bold, but I don't think there's any bookkeeper out there that can compete with a CPA that's been trained in taxes. Because mm-hmm. we do this year-round. We have 40 hours of education. And we're required um, and we're regulated by the state, Arizona State um, CPA Board of mm-hmm. Board of Accountancy. Mm-hmm. So we, we're very regulated. We're very into it. So, mm-hmm. again, if you have a, a, an app, and we're dealing really in the QuickBooks accounting area. We'll talk about other apps a little bit later. But mm-hmm. in that particular arena, arena, which Amy and I are tremendously comfortable in, 
there's no doubt that you're going to need a CPA if you have any business of size because the complicated new tax laws and the amount of savings that are available should certainly be taken advantage of. So uh, let's say that there is somebody out there that wants to start a business. At what point should they actually contact a CPA? Uh, Should they do that before? before? Yeah, absolutely before. (laughs) Is there a such thing as being too early or? No. 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 There was one situation where a client came in too early, and this is just humorous for an aside. My partner had a client come in because they were wondering about the tax consequences of all the lottery money. And he was like, wow. And he, they came in for about an hour and a half, and they're like, well, what do we do with this? What do we do? And then, and then my partner finally said, well, how much money did you win in the lottery? He said, oh, no, no, we haven't won yet, but when we do win, we just want to know. And I said, I think they came in too early. So that when you asked about an early story, and I still laugh to this day, but it took my partner about an hour to say, well, how much money did you actually win? <laughs> oh, no, no, we're just planning when we do win. But uh, but if you're thinking of a business, there is such a thing as, as early if you're just, hey, I'm going to open a restaurant someday in the next mm-hmm. five or ten years. Okay. You're probably not that serious. But if you're getting on the doorsteps, then it's very appropriate. Hey, Mike, and in our office, we don't charge for an initial consultation. Mm -hmm. So if somebody wants to come into us and talk to us about their new business, they're certainly welcome to. And at that point in time, we would say, hey, maybe you want to form an LLC. Maybe you want to make sure you have a payroll company or you know Mm -hmm. how to do payroll. Maybe you want to buy QuickBooks. We'll get you a federal ID. And there's a whole process that, again, Amy and I are like doctors with x-rays. Once we have the x-rays, we know what to tell them. Oh. And most clients provide an x-ray of some sort when they tell you what their general outline is. But mm-hmm. you shouldn't – for one hour – and Amy, I think, seen this in her career as well – in an hour or two – we can solve a tremendous amount of problems as it relates to a new mm-hmm. business that would take the owners hours and hours and hours of research. Okay. Absolutely. And then mm-hmm. never underestimate the fact that we have contacts in town. I love, yeah. you know, getting somebody's personality and setting them up with the right investment banker or the right attorney to drop the agreement. I'm sure you have mm-hmm. the same thing. Everything right. comes down to making sure that they're taken care of. Mm-hmm. Have we have you have you ever experienced something where uh where how these technologies are actually affecting the clients because they're let's say that you had a client that that's been your client for say 20 years and now you're moving into this now uh more tech uh type of software how would you move them from doing it old school style to now this do you find yourself having in to some do cases you don't we have some older clients that we send out our request for their information electronically we used to do that through the mail and some of them uh mike don't email that stuff to me because i'll never print it out i'll never figure it out so on our database we've sorted and there's 20 to 25 clients that we physically mail to and let, let me just do another side. When when we talk about apps and software, there was a recent fraud by MyPayrollHR.com for about $16 million, which was a cloud-based software company mm-hmm. that would do payroll. And essentially, the money would go to MyPayrollHR.com. I'm, I'm pretty sure that's the uh, website. Yeah, there's a, a FBI and an IRS investigation going on because we just heard from a client we're helping to fill out the form. So this 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 place was uh, it was, was a was company. Hacked. It was they, they were no, hacked. Or no, was so it, I'll tell you it? exactly what happened. Is they they were a payroll company and essentially, let's say it was my payroll and they said, Mike, you had two thousand dollars of withholdings and you need to take. $4,000 from your employees' checks, and you need to send that in in three days. We're going to handle all that for you. So if my payroll was Friday, on Friday, we're going to take that $4,000 out of your account to the tune of $16 million collectively. That company then had another company they dealt with. They took their fee out and said, all right, we have $15 million, $500,000 worth of payroll that needs to go to the IRS. And they would wire the money to another company that would disperse it 
through the IRS, and everybody's accounts will be credited timely. Mm. September 6th, September 8th recently, the CEO of the company called and said, don't wire that money to that account where they disperse it all. Put it in this new account. We set up this new account, and they wired the money to another company, another account, took the money out of that account, and $16 million worth of payroll taxes and payroll withholdings and employee paychecks Mm. was defrauded out of the public. Interesting. And my client, who I didn't know, um, I got an email saying, Mike, I just had a – my payroll didn't clear, and it's a fraud issue. And I was like, oh, my goodness. Yeah, I had to deal with a fraud issue with with my bank uh, just this morning. (laughs) Yeah, if you deal with fraud. But this is (laughs) – and there's no recourse. My understanding is uh, their insurance isn't going to cover it. And obviously the payroll company isn't going to cover it. And and there's no relief. I don't believe we took a quick law in the tax law. But if you give your money to ADP, and I I don't want to – they're a wonderful payroll company. But if they have the money and they don't send it to the IRS, the client's still responsible, not ADP. Oh, is that right? I can't quote that, but we started to do some preliminary research Mm -hmm. on that. But you have to be careful when you just – my client was susceptible to, oh, my payroll HR.com is, oh, and they do everything. And, mm-hmm. you know, an ADP was right across the street, right. a billion dollar company. Then, then you think everything's okay, and right. then, then right. it isn't. Right. And uh, your comment, Amy, uh, anything uh, with the software that you're currently using, how it's affecting the customers, your client base? Well, I, I think that, again, it. I hate always giving the answer, but it depends. I mean, we have some clients who have been with our firm for over 50 years and, you know, trying to get them to now be cloud-based and all, it's it's not going to happen. But, um, you know, the the newer clients that we bring on, if that's just the way that it's always been since they've started with us, you know, there's a different kind of engagement factor that we get. Um, But in addition to that, I mean, there are some other clients that we've had for a really long time. And if you can show them that it makes their life easier and you move it in inches, they're perfectly fine with it. So, Excellent, excellent points, both of you. Always fascinating and always ahead of the game. The Computer Doctor is Aaron Moss on Tucson Business Radio X. We're talking with uh, Amy Chavez and Michael Flowers, uh, both uh, very talented and uh, very qualified uh, people to uh, talk about uh, how technology has affected uh, the uh, taxing, taxation and accounting finance uh, industries. And uh, we're, we're talking about uh, how these applications and these apps have uh, affected uh, the industry in, all, you know, in the past and even concurrently, how they affect the offices, how they affect the clients, and uh, how people are being received. We even uh, showed how sometimes it can even cause problems, okay? So uh, sometimes, uh, you know, from, from a technolo- technological background that I come from, I'm always thinking about the security of things. Uh, how secure are people's information in these systems, uh, especially the cloud systems? You're sending them documents, um, or you know, even to even just to sign a document now. Mm-hmm. You know, just have you know, type in your name and then select your uh, your signature. You know, or whichever style that you like. You right, 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 <laughs> which, right. Which seemed when I first saw that, I, it was hilarious to me. But um, what uh, if I can go back to uh, Amy and uh, uh, do another question about what are some of the challenges of some of the newer technologies uh, when when they're first introduced? We kind of covered that a little bit, but um, you know, when when a new technology is introduced or even a new law, how is does how, does that set you guys back, or how do you deal with that? You know, I, I think that um, Michael alluded to this earlier. The the biggest challenge that we have whenever there's a new technology or a new law is training, understanding it enough and getting in front of it that you can train your staff to deal with it and you can train your clients on how to utilize it and how to have it be beneficial for them as opposed to another change, another headache, another thing that we have to go through. Do these uh, do these software companies do they give uh, training like maybe like you like some sort of YouTube video type type training of how to use no, the software? No, they'll on their side? give physical training or online or uh, webinars if you would. But we love change. 
We love tax law changes because it generates conversations. It generates, actually it generates more work the more the tax laws change because as the tax laws change, clients are more and more reliant on you. And with the most recent tax law change last year, that was the amount, the most amount of money our firm spent on continuing education. Well, and I don't know about you, Michael, but I've never been more popular at a party than right. I was last year. <laughs> right. <There you> <laughs> Everybody wanted to talk to the accountant for sure. some reason. Everybody wants to know, you know, how does it affect me? And uh, mm-hmm. so from that perspective, it's good. But the good news for for CPA firms in general, if you have a back office or – I don't know that there's a firm out there. Maybe some of the big four accounting firms have their own software mm-hmm. for tax returns. But I think predominantly, even Amy's firm, as large as they are, they're probably using a, a third party to uh, process their tax returns. And that in and of itself is an industry. And there's mm-hmm. very few CPA firms. All oh, the tax that can law take change. It on like that. Let me go change the software and let me go see what happens. We'd be out of business if we'd have to maintain the back office. So from the front office, we just need to be capable. And what's surprising is on occasions, we as the CPAs are calling the software company and say, wait, you haven't gotten that exactly right. And in this particular instance, and then they always go, well, there's an override on box seven, and you can do an override. And, <laughs> you know, we find exceptions, but that just tells you our skill level that we're not strictly relying on the software. Because mm-hmm. sometimes you know what the answer is, and the software won't give it to you. And then as an option, yeah. 80% of the time there's a box or something we didn't do correctly in the software, but 20% of the time, no, the software company is wrong, and now they either have to do an override or in some cases, um, as, as we have software companies, every week or every day almost during tax season, we're getting updates. Mm-hmm. And in the middle of doing somebody's tax return, I'll say, wait, don't finish this return because this line has been affected and you have to go back to the update. So the software companies, where they're spending tons of money on R&D and overhead, and that's why they can get $20,000 for their software mm-hmm. for one firm, a 10-person firm, times you know, probably 10,000, 20,000 right. clients. So they, they have enough offices to uh, make sure they're getting it right. Right. So, so the risks for the clients. Uh, so if, if a, if a person wants to uh, do their own accounting, their own bookkeeping and their own taxes, um, how, what, I know. I know what your answer is. It's going to depend. Don't. But no, uh, but no. You want to do your own search. You're going to pull your own teeth out. You you know. I mean, <laughs> no, well. what I'm saying is that accounting and taxes are, are that type of industry that the general layperson's going to cost themselves money. Our motto with our clients is we're going to save you more than we charge you. If we charge you five hundred dollars for a return and I don't five five hundred dollars worth of savings, or why don't you fund an IRA? Why don't you have your kid on the payroll? Why don't you do this? Why don't you do that? Then, right. we, as Amy says, we're not going to do a W two type client charge them three hundred dollars, and we didn't do anything. That's what CPAs have a, a I've an heard integrity <laughs> about them that we don't want to charge money unless we can justify. In some cases, way too. <laughs> too worried about it but you know in most cases the the client wants it right we're going to get it right we're going to save you money and i think amy can also attribute the fact that we save more than we charge clients right well one of the things i'm sorry but one of the things that michael touched on was and it definitely was a huge deal this year was say that you do decide that you're going to do your own taxes and you've been doing them for five years and you're perfectly happy well all of a sudden the 2018 tax law comes around and as we're preparing the returns we're noticing that the software is not keeping up with what we've actually learned because this year it was rolled out so late you know if you're a lay person and you're not getting all of the classes and you don't have all of your you know your co-workers with all of their specific knowledge kind of looking over your shoulder too if you don't have that kind of community of knowledge around you you're not going to notice that you just missed a twenty thousand dollar deduction you're just gonna file it because that's how you've always filed it 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 can cost you so Mm -hmm. so when when does a client know that they're in over their head they're saying you know what I think most yeah. clients know it when they see 
their business profit and loss and balance sheet and okay put that on a tax return what are you talking put that on a tax return i don't even know what a tax return looks like so right. and and as amy mentioned the new tax law provided a 20 percent qualified business income deduction 20 percent off so if i made a hundred thousand dollars I'm only going to pay tax on 80000 if I go to my CPA that fills out the form properly. If I've done it last year and I made 102000 and this year I made 100000 I'm not going to know there's a 20% deduction for that. Mm-hmm. So that client, $20,000 deduction, you're in a 30% bracket. That's a $6,000 savings. If a CPA charge you... Three thousand dollars to do that, you still have three thousand dollars. So okay. it's it's the numbers, and it generally makes sense to see a CPA. Again, I'm a. I did one job. They paid me ten thousand dollars. I have no expenses. It was just some speaking engagement. You can possibly figure that out to put it on Schedule C, but then you have self employment tax issues. You got the possibility of a pension plan. And you got the possibility that did I take my 20% deduction because that qualified for a 20% deduction. So Mm -hmm. even a very simple one transaction, transaction, I think Amy and I could find ways to save you money. Why don't you put the the, put 10 grand to that in a solo 401k, don't pay any taxes. Mm -hmm. What do you mean? I can do that? Sure, you can do that. Mm -hmm. So it's that kind of stuff that. Makes so, sense. so this uh, the the accounting software that uh, that's used by your two respective offices. Um, what, uh, what what kind of uh, IT support locally? Because uh, do do you employ? Uh, and the reason why I ask that is because the the software is only as good as you know the actual systems mm-hmm. that that are in your offices. Uh, your uh, internet connection, because you mentioned the cloud. You know if you if you mm-hmm. have a uh, uh, an unstable connection there and you got a client on the phone wanting information, you're hitting the button on your computer and you're getting that roll around thing <laughs> right. going, 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 going. What do you do now? Do you have some sort of like what, what kind of uh, IT support uh, is uh, our? We are benefit? very lucky to have an in-house IT person. And mm-hmm. I can't even tell you all of the initials and certifications that he has. Mm-hmm. So we're, we're extremely lucky in that regard. And I've been there long enough that before he was there, we had somebody else who wasn't as who wasn't as adamant about staying on top of everything as he is. And we had a lot of downtime. You know, the computer's going down, as you were saying, that circle going around and around and around. Well, you basically are just hearing money drain, (laughs) just drain away. Um, So the person that we have now, he specializes in um, in security. Mm -hmm. And I find that very comforting because we have a lot of people's information and we take that very seriously. And we're. Mm -hmm. As I've said, I think I've said it three times now, we're incredibly lucky to have somebody else who specializes in that and takes it just as seriously as we do. Excellent. And uh, Th- That's an overhead cost. I mean, that's part of mm-hmm. the cost of your tax return in Amy's firm that um, somebody's providing that service. We have a uh, outside consultant that's been with us since 1984 approximately. Oh and he's put in all our software, and he works with a number of other CPA firms. Very familiar with all the search software, very familiar with our server, and I don't know how he does it because I would never want his job. Trey, I'm sorry about this, but I'd never want your job. He's on call, and if we have an issue, Trey will show up. You know, Mike, I got three, you know, I got to get two more emergencies, but I'll be there at five, or I'll be there Saturday, I'll be there at midnight. He has a key to our office, he has a key to my house because I have problems at my home computer. And hey, <laughs> Trey, you know, he just was in and installing speakers for me. That tells you how much technology I do. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I got some new speakers, I wanted to lo- download the drivers, et cetera, et cetera. And, you know, Trey, I'll be up at your house at four o'clock. So mm. Trey's been a friend of the firm, knows the firm, and knows others. CPAs and yeah. um, you can't get along without that. And occasionally, yeah. if it's a software problem, it's unbelievably frustrating. Like um, Saturday, our uh, tax software went down, and some 
one or two of the employees went home and was like, well, it's only down for an hour. <laughs> <laughs> but they, oh, the software's down. I got nothing to do type thing. Yeah. So It's the accountant's snow day. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's our snow day when the software goes yeah, down. Yeah, it, it must be that way. But, you know, on, on, the, on the flip side, speaking from, from an IT background, uh, whenever whenever a new major client uh, comes my way, I have to give them a disclaimer. It's going to take me, you know, somewhere between a month, sometimes even up to four months, just to get up to speed to how everything works. Sometimes, oh, sure. uh, sometimes uh, we like, for example, I'm doing. A, I have a large contract with a with, with a school, a charter school, and uh, for they have a total of four server rooms in uh, several different buildings, and. Uh, for a while, I thought that one particular, this is where the internet was coming in for the whole thing. And then one day, the internet does go down. I reset that one box, but I, in That's turn, it was, one. in turn, it was the phones. I right. knocked out the phones instead of the, <laughs> so, but it took me the, you know, now the, the, the guy that already had the whole system mapped in his head, he was gone. Right. I got no information from him. Okay. But it took for something failing for me to know. You know what what the solution was. I think you what know. we do traditionally is we we use QuickBooks because everybody's using QuickBooks. Mm-hmm. It's and a big I think client client based uh, system. QuickBooks you know. and is the preferred software I think for ninety percent of accountants, just because there used to be Peachtree and some other software that was a little bit more custom. And a little bit more, hey, I hired a new bookkeeper and she doesn't know Peachtree. Mm. Now you got a complete disconnect that, hey, I got great software and the person who knew it really well, they left me. And now it's almost like custom software and who's going to learn this? And am I going to find that person? And once I'm invested in that person, I hope to God they don't leave. So mm. everything we do now is sort of QuickBooks based because if the client's staff or a data entry person leaves, it's very easy to find another person. And it's very easy to train somebody on QuickBooks because now all the CPA and That's CPA right. firms know that pro- program. So they sort of did what McDonald's did with the hamburger. You would think nobody could have the best hamburger or sell billions and billions of hamburgers. Yeah. And nobody could have the right software. When we first came out, I was back in the manual days and CPAs made probably a third of their living just doing bookkeeping for clients. Mm. And that whole business has evaporated from $500 a month to now, well, the software mic's $100. How are you going to charge me $500 a month? Yeah. So that's how technology's changed. And at one time, books, they call them books because they were physical ledgers and they people were – all right, you gave me eight dollars. I'm putting eight dollars in cash. I'm going to credit sales, and mm-hmm. at the end of the month, I'll add up all the sales. I'll add up all mm-hmm. my cash, and I'll physically put it. You know, it was a very, very monotonous process. There were companies that had accounts payable departments of hundreds of people just paying bills, and now yeah, it's all back automated. in my day. I used to fill right. out my accounts payable slip right. to be. Faxed over to California, right. so they could put it in a book. So right. could fax? Do that. What's that? Yeah. I know. <laughs> but oh, that was a that was a savings, man. A mm-hmm. fax. You could actually get this overnight. So yeah. the profession has changed, and as uh, as I alluded to at one time, tax returns were done with the third party processing company, where you they would. I think they curried the tax returns because there wasn't FedEx or anything. I forget. Well, they may have mailed them. You may have mailed it out Monday. They get it Tuesday. They didn't put it Wednesday. You get it back Thursday or Friday, mm. assuming one day mail, and it was that type process. But now, as I say, it's instantaneous. Okay. Well, you know, we've talked a lot about uh, uh, about the past, and we've talked a lot about the present of uh, of this industry. I'd like to just peer into the future. Uh, what what is in store for uh for, for the future of accounting finance things like that. So as the technologies evolve, what are some things that uh that you believe uh may may be happening in the future when it comes to these things and also how secure are a lot of these things? Well, I mean, if you listen to some of the some of the people in the CPA realm, they're they're trying to go as far as to say that 
you know, basic accounts are going to be replaced with artificial intelligence and all of that. Um, I can't go that far. I don't I don't think that there's any chance that that we're going to get to that point. But I do see everything being a little bit more technology focused. Mm. I mean, if you look at how far everything's come in the last 10 years in the entire world, yes, that's impacting accounting. And so we have a lot of different ways that we need to go. But I think that that's why we're all and I, and I don't want to say we're all, I want to let Michael speak for himself, but we're focusing more and more on the consulting side because everything else is starting to feel a little bit more like a commodity to this new generation. As a tax return, it's just some numbers. So that's where you have to put the focus on the people and the focus on what are you providing with that tax return? Yes, we're keeping you compliant, but what are we giving you? What are we helping you with? And then as far as security is concerned, I think that as long as we stay very cognizant about what's happening, we can hopefully stay on top of it or ahead of it. Um, you know, the same way that before everything was technology based, there were different ways that, you know, the quote unquote bad guys were able to get to you. So this is just a different way and a different and a different thought process on keeping people safe. I see. Uh just to uh, just to add a little something to that uh, um, uh, artificial intelligence, uh, there's uh, at, at some point we're going to do a, a a show about how technology has affected the law, and we hope to have some. Uh, maybe we, hopefully we can even get a judge and maybe some uh, uh, some lawyers in here. Uh, but th- there's actually software out there where you plug it in and it'll tell you the likelihood of it being. Th- Judged guilty, as guilty uh, or innocent. <laughs> and you could actually make little changes of how you present your case. And a program will actually tell you the chances of it being being judged innocent or guilty. <laughs> so, you know, that, you know that, that's, ne- that's There'll never be a, a substitute for consulting. And no. there'll mm-hmm. never be a computer that has the ability to do what consultants do. Right. I say that in your business, again, I can buy software and it works unbelievably and it corrects itself. I'm still going to need you because it, it, it corrected itself, but it's not working. But it I mean. corrected itself incorrectly. Right, and I got a circle. <laughs> you know, I got a circle. That doesn't mean it's working. So mm-hmm. you know, we've been involved. In, we focused our, our business on the consultant aspect ever since I started it because that's where the value is in a CPA firm. There's no... There's a tremendous value to the tax return itself, but it's what went into that. And once a CPA has taken your raw numbers, and what I love to do is take the client and, you know, when you gave this to me, it showed $150,000 of accrual basis income. You would have owed $60,000 in taxes. Through depreciation, the pension plan, the subchapter S, et cetera, et cetera, we got that down to $27,000, and you've saved $30,000 in tax. Mm -hmm. Was that worth $2,500? I would hope so. Mm -hmm. Was it worth five grand? Was it worth $1,000? So we've generated, you know, I've been doing this for 40 years, and CPAs have been doing this forever because. There's a real value to go into a CPA. And so, I think Amy and I would just like to distinguish, Mike, what's a CPA? Well, a CPA is a certified public account. Well, my guy's a CPA. Your guy's probably not a CPA if he doesn't have his name on the firm. About 98% of the CPA firms all have their names R and A stand stood for the last name of two of their founding partners. Used to be Michael C. Flowers CPA. Now it's Flowers Riga. So, whatever firm I was involved in, there'd be a Flowers involved. Amy's name is she's a partner or a shareholder in a firm, but that firm is a firm of individuals that maybe only two people are on the the letterhead or the logo, but. All the employees are CPAs, or predominantly most of the employees are CPAs. So I think it's important that people know what a certified public accountant is. To be a CPA, you have to not only attend college. In Arizona, you have to have a master's degree. You have to pass a four-part rigorous exam that um, is like the bar. After you pass the exam, generally you need two years' experience before you can and working under a mentor. Mm-hmm. And then you are regulated by the Arizona State Board of Accountancy. If you go to an accountant 
and he messes up your return and he steals your money and does everything and you're looking for an authoritative board, they can't do anything to that person if they're not a CPA. Hmm. But if your CPA did that, then my consequence is I have to go up to the state board and defend myself. If I don't defend myself and actually I did hmm. do something egregious, I lose my CPA certificate. Right. And so, then I become that guy that's Mike Flowers, but the accountant, not Mike Flowers, the CPA. Right. So there's some level of uh, responsibility on, 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 the, uh, on the part of the uh, certified public accountant, whereas if it's just It's like some- doctor nurse. I mean, I use that analogy. We're the doctors that we went through to get the appropriate certification to be a doctor. And nurses can be RNs and et cetera, and we have – administrative assistants or staff that are studying to be the CPA, and they're somewhat the equivalent of the nurses, but we're the doctors of the industry, and we're the ones that, you know, if you're going to have heart surgery, do you want the non-doctor doing your heart surgery? I right. Hope not, so. so so here's uh, here's where I call out some uh, advice for our listeners, because there may be some listeners that are not in uh, – uh, Tucson or even in the state of Arizona, if somebody is looking to uh, hire a CPA, what are some things uh, to look for? You mentioned to actually see their name uh, as uh, as you know in their office. Like when you say when you say their name, like like Aaron be Moss, on their CPA. Logo. It's Flowers Riga CPAs, and okay. every state board of accountancy has a list of who their certified public accountants are. So if, for example, I was investigating Mike Flowers, first of all, you can go online, and we have a very nice online presence, Flowers, Rieger, and Associates. And mm-hmm. I was a small business leader of the year, and we have very nice credentials. But if you went to the Arizona State Board of Accountancies, who are the current CPAs, Mike Flowers, I would show up there. Mm-hmm. Putting Tom Jones... Um, and wait, he's not a CPA, so that's one way. Um, How would somebody go about finding that out? There's a. There's I think a if you registry. went to the State Board of Accountancy, there's a state list of all Board of Arizona State Board of Accountancy, New York State Board, whatever state you're in, there's the equivalent of a State Board of Accountancy that's in charge mm-hmm. of that state's CPAs, and there's a list of all the CPAs that you can check against. Okay, excellent. Um, what uh, Any any advice, uh, Amy, on uh, what people can do uh, to find out uh, who's the right CPA if they're outside of Arizona? Well, as, as Michael said, you can start with the state board, and then once you get a few names, there's nothing better than actually making an appointment, going in and talking to them because a lot of it is about personal fit. You need to be comfortable. Money is one of the most personal things that you can talk about. You don't even talk about it with your friends most of the time. <laughs> so you want to make sure that whoever you're asking to guide you is somebody that you're actually comfortable asking to guide you. Okay. I would also add it depends on the size of the firm. I think that's probably the biggest determining factor for if I'm a relatively small business, I'm probably better off with the small sole proprietor to medium-sized firm. If I'm regional and have five or six offices, the local guy's probably not good enough, and maybe some of the smaller CPA firms aren't good enough. So you generally want to align yourself. The bigger businesses Mm-hmm. The national firms align with national CPA firms. We have a, what's called the Big Four, and the Big Four do IBM and Coke and all the mm-hmm. publicly held companies. You get below that. Amy's firm is large at 50 people, and they can handle larger clients than we can. Mm-hmm. But if you're a Tucson-based client doing a million to five million, Generally, you're going to be with the small to medium sized firm, and mm-hmm. if you're doing fifty million, you're going to tend to be in a bigger firm, and if you're doing a billion, you're going to be with the national firms. Okay, and uh, so so uh, kind of uh, doing things uh, uh, when a business actually starts. Uh, we had mentioned earlier that uh, that they should contact a uh, CPA firm early, do this research early, go to this uh, 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 the CPA board of their state. And uh, any other advice for new businesses? Because I know uh, both of you, you, you have a lot of the, of the same uh, types of clients. Um, so what other, what other advice can you give to new businesses and entrepreneurs from a CPA standpoint? Anything else? 
Well, you know, I think that we've we've covered it a good majority of it. Just as soon as you're ready to kind of pull that trigger and start your business, get in to see somebody, make sure that you're the right structure, make sure that you have everything set up the way that you need to. Um, at that point, you probably don't even have an accounting software. You might not even know what you need. You know, there's a lot of guidance that you can find. Okay. We tend to be the quarterback when somebody comes and, Mike, I'm starting a new business or me and my partner are starting a new business. And we would generally say, all right, are you going to be a, a sole proprietor, a partnership, an S Corp, a C Corp, or an LLC? Wait, that's too many choices. <laughs> I don't know what I want to be. Well, yeah. that's why you're hiring us. But each one of those has a very dramatic tax consequence. And if you want to start your business off correctly, no better substitutes from going to see a CPA and getting some advice on the front end. Would that also include seeing perhaps maybe an attorney or a lawyer out front because they can consult on those same things? The acronym we have is ABILITY, which is your accountant, your business lawyer, your – well, accountant, banker, insurance agent, and lawyer, ABIL, is the four – general services that you want to start out your business with. And then it expands from there to a pension administrator, a payroll company, uh, et cetera, et cetera. As you grow. <laughs> as you grow, even out of the gate, you may need some of those services. And who's better to advise you than somebody like myself or Amy that's advised thousands of businesses on mm -hmm. how to start, how to complete your return and how to deal in the financial arena. Again, you're a great cook and you got a great restaurant. <laughs> Doesn't mean you have a great CPA. Right. And two restaurants doing the exact same amount of business with the exact same amount of income. At the end of the day, it's what you make and what you take home, not what you look like on paper. And there's so many businesses out there that may not be making any money. Uh, they're, just, uh, they're just taking money in. Money is coming in. Money is going out. Uh, but what's the bottom line? You know, are, are in the end, are you number one? Are you paying yourself? Mm -hmm. You know, <laughs> we've told clients they'd be better off not being in business, and they'd be better off making ten dollars an hour minimum wage. Because I had a client that lost money for like he was a new client, and he lost money for like thirteen years. And in year fourteen, he says, "Mike, I made eight grand." I says, "Well, in those past thirteen years, if you just worked at ten dollars an hour, you'd have X amount of dollars versus the fifty to hundred grand you've invested to get to make ten or twenty grand." And mm -hmm. again, the bookkeepers, you know, just feel, oh, you lost another ten, you lost another ten. Mm -hmm. Somebody should have taken a time out and said, you know. That's right, because you can think that you're, tells. yeah, you can think that you're doing well, and uh, but but then when you actually run the numbers, yeah, uh, you know, uh, I'm I'm a great fan of that uh, show. Uh, what's it called? Uh, Shark Tank. Yeah, you know, when people have these business ideas, they're presented to these sharks that right. are in the room, and they're saying, okay, well, how much have you did? How much? What's your expenses? Right. Bam. So you actually haven't made any money, right? You know, you right. you spent this, you got that. And uh, and for and you know to watch them on the show said yes but we've put our heart we've put our soul we believe you know and, and you know, I haven't they, eaten in three months <laughs> and I we're doing great yeah we just need that extra twenty thousand dollars to get over the hump <laughs> <Right>. exactly <laughs> all right well um, I want to uh, as we wrap things up here I wanted to uh, just uh, plug my guests a little bit more we had uh, Amy uh, Chavez on the program um, her firm is. Uh, Rand, uh, I'm sorry, uh, R and A CPAs. That's R A N D A CPAs dot com, and uh, their uh, main phone number uh, for their office is five two zero eight eight one forty nine hundred. You could also see her on LinkedIn and Facebook. We're going to put these uh, on the uh, uh, links in, on, inside the show notes uh, that you can see on Tucson Business Radio X, uh, dot com. Uh, also, uh, Michael Flowers, his information is again uh, uh, flowersrieger.com. That's F L O W E R S R I E G E R. Dot com, and he can also be uh, uh, found on LinkedIn and the Facebook page, uh, sure. and we'll put that on. The main phone number for his firm is five two zero three two seven eight seven zero six. 
Okay. Is that and Aaron, we we uh, we offer a no charge initial consultation, regardless what state you're in. My my goal in life somewhat is to, uh, you know, if you're going into business and you shouldn't be in business, then you know maybe that's the advice you need. Okay, we want to thank our guests on the show. We hope all of our listeners uh, learned something about technology uh, uh, as it relates to accounting and finance. Listen to new episodes of Tucson Tech Talk every second Monday of the month. Uh, Tucson Tech Talk is sponsored by Computer Doctor of Tucson because technology is great when it works. Until then, be safe and know your technology. Mm-hmm.